Hello, welcome to my favorite unit for the next couple of weeks, and that is the atoms, protons, electrons, chemical elements, all that fun stuff. As you can see, I have a picnic table that I would love to have lunch on because I'm a chemical nerd like that, and I love looking at chemical elements in a different fashion. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started with you guys on chapter four. Chapter four deals with the atoms. Now, let me kind of brief you in on what the atom is. First off, many of you all know that the atom is the smallest particle of mankind, the smallest particle of an element. In other words, you can actually break things down to their simplest form and you're going to get it down to the atom. Now, as you look at your screen, there are a couple of PowerPoint slides that I'm going to go through with you on this particular unit. To start off, John Dalton proposed that all matter is made up of tiny particles. These particles are molecules or atoms. Molecules can be broken down into atoms by chemical processes. However, atoms, once they get to that point, cannot be broken down by chemical or physical processes. Now, to sum it up, an element is composed of tiny, indivisible, indestructible particles called atoms. Now, this is what Dalton came up with, you know, a long, 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 long time ago. And again, he described atoms, of course, as basically an element that is tiny, indivisible, and indestructible. Statement number two, he mentioned that all atoms of an element are identical and have the same properties. All atoms of an element, so look at, let's say, sodium. They are identical and have the same properties. But then he went on further and came up with three other proposals. And number three states that atoms of different elements combine to form compounds. So, for instance, I can take sodium, combine that with chlorine, and get sodium chloride. I can take potassium, combine that with fluorine, and get potassium fluoride. I can take iron, combine that with any other elements and get iron and whatever that is. So I can take atoms of different elements to combine them together to come up with formulas or compounds. And by the way, a compound is two or more elements coming together. Speaking of compounds, in statement number four, compounds contain atoms in small whole number ratios. So in other words, you will never, ever, ever see a formula written out as, let's say, like we know H2O is H subscript 2 and then the O. We will never see that written as H2.3 O 1.1. Like you will never, ever see it written out that way. So compounds contain atoms in whole number ratios. The next one, number five, atoms can be combined in more than one ratio for, for excuse me, for form, to form different compounds. Now, this is a typo on this screen, so that's why I was stuttering. But again, atoms can combine in more than one ratio to form different compounds. So in other words, I can take H and oxygen, hydrogen and oxygen to form H2O. I can take those same two elements and form OH to give me hydroxide ions. I can also take two hydrogens, two oxygens to form H2O2, and better yet, the last one, H3O to give me hydronium ions. I mean, that's a mouthful talking about Dalton's atomic theory. But of course, you have other scientists that come along and say, oh no, that's not right. We need to go ahead and prove your theories wrong. Now, you know, theories can be disproven, okay? So in other words, just because you state something doesn't mean that it's so, unless somebody can come and back it up or discount what you've said. So as you can see based on this screen, the first two parts of atomic theory were later proven incorrect. And you're going to see why momentarily. But proposals three, four, and five hold true today. So here's where we come along finding that there was evidence that those atoms can be divisible. And that was around the 1800s. And as we know, there are three components that an atom must contain. Number one, they must have protons, positively charged protons. It's a P with a plus. The next thing they must have are electrons. It's an E with a negative charge. And the last thing they must contain are neutrons. Neutral, the N with a superscript of zero. As you know, J.J. Thompson came up with this subatomic model in 1903. So you're talking about a hundred year time span when people came along and said, oh no, we need to prove the former theory incorrect. Or let's say they wanted to basically um, 
enhance the prior theory. Now, this particular chart here, this table 4.1, I want you to make sure that you put that on your notes, the guided notes that I provided you with in your um on Blackboard. So if you go to Blackboard and you look at your guided notes for this particular page, this is what you're going to write. If you look at some of the questions that are on those guided notes, there's a question that asks you whether or not, you know, where, if you know the location of these subatomic particles. For instance, I know based on looking at that chart, electrons are found outside the nucleus, but my protons and neutrons are found inside the nucleus. Let's take a look at their masses also. Their masses, the protons and neutrons have a mass that's greater than that of the electrons. So let's see if we can answer some questions on our guided notes. True or false? Protons are heavier than electrons. True or false? If you said false, you are correct. Actually, no, hold on, back up. Protons are heavier than electrons. Why? Because as you look at the mass, the proton number is one and the electron is one, one thousand of a number. So therefore, that is true. Protons are heavier than electrons. Bullet point number two, the nucleus contains all the protons and neutrons of an atom. What did you guess? If you said true, you are correct. The protons and neutrons are smack dab in the middle of that nucleus. Bullet point number three, protons and electrons are in the nucleus. Protons and electrons are in the nucleus. Is that true or false? It is false because protons and neutrons are the only thing that is in the nucleus. The only thing that's on the outside are the electrons. And the last bullet point, protons and neutrons are outside the nucleus. That is false. Electrons are the only thing that's circulating outside the nucleus. Now on this next slide, we have some examples based on atomic notation. Now atomic notation is important because you're going to have to know how to write them out in terms of like shorthanding some of these elements in their, in their um, protons and electron notations. So you have atomic notation on this one screen and you have the isotope notation on the next screen. Now what is an isotope? Isotopes are basically all atoms that have the same element but they have also the same number of protons. Most elements occur naturally with varying numbers of neutrons. And why is a neutron different? Well here we go. Neutrons are different because of their masses. So if the mass is different then of course you're going to have a different number of neutrons because you're going to have to subtract the atomic mass number from the atomic number to get those numbers of neutrons. The correct way to write atomic notation is to provide the atomic mass number on the top, the atomic number on the bottom, and the chemical symbol. I'll provide you with an example that you can see with a real live element from the periodic table. But first, let me give you the isotope notation. The isotope notation is basically the chemical symbol dash, that's not a subtraction symbol, dash atomic mass number. So let's take a look at how to write out the isotope notation and the atomic notation. First off, I'm going to look at an element such as sodium. I know that sodium has atomic number 11. The sodium also has atomic mass number 22.99, but when you're writing out the isotope notation or the atomic notation, the mass number must be rounded off to the nearest whole number. So let's go back to our example with sodium. Sodium has atomic mass number 22.99, but I'm going to write that as Na-23. I always round that number off. Now, when I look at my atomic notation, you must remember the atomic notation deals with the two A's. Atomic mass number, which is on top. The atomic number, which is on the bottom. And then 
our chemical symbol. Always refer to your periodic table for these numbers when you are not sure. Here is an example of a periodic table that has the different types of numbers on them. On your periodic table, you have the atomic mass numbers. These are the numbers that you will see with the decimals at the very bottom of each block. And at the top is the atomic number. Those are whole numbers. This periodic table is very fascinating because there are so many things that you can actually capture from looking at this chart. So if I were to look at, let's say, I'm going to make this a little bit closer. Um, let's say I was looking at going back to sodium over here. As I mentioned before, sodium has atomic number 11, but the mass number is 22.99. Always remember to round off your atomic mass numbers. Now, one thing you want to keep in mind is that the isotopes of various elements occur naturally in nature, but that doesn't necessarily mean that every element on the periodic table has an isotope. They're all different. I will provide a chart for you at a later time. In the meantime, let's take a look at some more examples. If I look at potassium, potassium has atomic number 19. But if I take a look at that, I notice that potassium, that number 19, also represents the protons and electrons. Atomic mass units and protons, electrons, and neutrons and atomic notation, isotope notation, we have to remember a couple of rules on our sheet. Here you have to calculate the protons and electrons, refer to the atomic number. Keep in mind the following acronym, PEA, protons, electrons, atomic number. They're all the same. To calculate the mass number, you're going to be given the protons and the neutrons. Now, the mass number that you see on the periodic table is exactly that number for that particular element. However, there may come a time where you're going to be given a different proton number and a different neutron number on a chart, such as the one that we're going to do below, that you'll need to add those two numbers together to get your mass number. Lastly, to get our neutrons, you're going to subtract your atomic mass number from your atomic number. And again, please be sure to round off your atomic mass number to the nearest whole number. Let's get started with this handout. Here I give you, have given you manganese, the chemical symbol is MN, the atomic mass number is 55. Again, I got that from my periodic table because I rounded off the number that was there. My atomic number is 25, protons is 25, neutrons. Now in order to get my neutrons, I need to subtract these two numbers here, the atomic number, mass number, excuse me, from the atomic number. And that's where I get the 30 from. My atomic number, protons, and electrons all have the same number, which is 25. To get my atomic notation, I'm going to simply think about my two A's. The atomic mass number is on top, the atomic number is on the bottom, and then the chemical symbol is MN. The isotope notation is just simply the chemical symbol dash the atomic mass number. It's just that simple. Take a look at the next row. The only thing I've given you is 84. This is when you'll have to refer to your periodic table to find the element that comes close to 84. If I look closely at my noble gas group, which is the last column, I get krypton, which is 83.80. Atomic number is 36. So that's where the 84 comes from. So I know it's krypton. Symbol is KR. I've already provided you with the 84. The atomic number is 36, protons is 36, and electrons is 36. Remember, atomic number, protons, electrons all have the same number. So you're just going to repeat that three times. The last example here for neutrons is to simply subtract these two columns together and you end up with 48. My atomic notation is 84 on the top. 36 on the bottom, KR. My isotope notation is KR-84. Let's do fluorine. Fluorine symbol is F. I need to look at my periodic table and find fluorine, which is right here. 
I have two numbers. I have 19 and I have 9. Remember, the number with the decimals is the atomic mass number. So therefore, I'm going to put 19 for the mass number. That top number that I saw previously of 9 is the atomic number. I'm going to write 9 for the atomic number. Protons is 9. Electrons is 9. I will subtract these two numbers here, 19 minus 9, to give me 10. For my atomic notation, 19 over 9, F. And for my isotope notation, F dash 19. The last one is, is just as easy as the first one. We know that's the symbol for oxygen. The atomic mass number for oxygen is 16 according to my periodic table. The atomic number is 8. Protons is 8. And so are my electrons. When I subtract 16 from 8, I also get 8 for my neutrons. The atomic notation is 16, 8, O for oxygen. And the isotope notation is O-16.